Hey, have you ever noticed you never see a Percheron with socks, but you'll never find a Clydesdale without at least one? And when you look at true wild horses still alive today, or if you look at the cave paintings of them, there's no socks. So why do domesticated horses have white markings? That's what I set out to find out. I read over 10 research papers, some on genetics, some on domestication, and finally I took a bit of a detour into horse cloning and breed standard to figure all this out. This is Luna, my dog, my little shadow. You see those markings? They came from her border collie father. And while that is cool to know about her specifically, as you will see, it actually tells a much bigger story, one that goes much further back. A quick look at the animals in the wild, and we can see that most of them, if not all of them, are mostly brown or black with barely a splash of white. But looking around today at their domesticated descendant, suddenly white markings are everywhere. What is going on? First, let's understand how animals get white fur. Mammals only come in shades of black and brown, with a bit of reddish and, of course, white. That's because mammals can only make two pigments. Eumelamine, that gives them the dark or black, dark brown or black, and pheomelamine, that is more reddish, but that can sometimes be diluted to yellow or orange. These are two pigments, and they're only found in one type of cell in the body, specialized cells that are called melanocytes. If for some reason there is part of the body that has no melanocyte, you get pink skin and white fur there. And if you have melanocyte, they're present, but somehow they're unable to produce pigment, then you get the same result. Pink skin, white fur. And it doesn't take much to disrupt this whole system. So far, over 50 mutations have been identified that do just that. And most of them are because of a single change in the nucleotide of the gene, one letter change in the instruction for protein making. These are such a simple kind of mistake in the genes or mutation that they do occur spontaneously. For example, you've probably seen some picture of uniquely marked moose or deer circulating on the internet and showing some very interesting white pattern. Although we do find these white markings, I mean, they do occur, for whatever reason, they have very little staying power. They simply do not persist in the population. Somehow, they must not be beneficial to the animals in the wild, perhaps because of predation or temperature control, whatever it might be, they remain rare. And that is exactly why they attract so much attention. Wild animal with lots of big spatches of white? That's unusual. In fact, the more extensive the white, the rarer it is, to the point that completely white animal holds a very special place in almost every culture around the world. White animals are attached to myths, legends, and belief, and for some, they are the link to the sacred. But a funny thing happens with domestication. White patches that are rare in the wild become very common. Perhaps it's the sheltered life of a domesticated animal that allow for these that to have white to survive longer than they would in the wild. Well, that is one of the explanation. White markings and white fur are useful and desired by us, humans. They help animals stand out, you know, from their wild counterpart. They make identification much easier, and it can certainly make them more desirable in some cases because it's a little bit rarer. And so, with this value put on them, they get more breeding opportunities than they would have in the wild. The other explanation is one that comes from the study done on selective breeding of silver foxes. Originally, silver fox were strictly bred for their fur. But when they started selectively breeding for tamer temperament, less aggressive, more friendly toward human, a funny thing happened the predominantly dark gray foxes started to be born with white patches. It led the expert to start looking at the link between tame and docile behavior and white patches in the fur. It certainly wasn't the first time we were seeing that pattern. And while there's no clear explanation as of yet that has been put forward, there are some theories. Theories that look at maybe there's some mutation at the very early phase of embryo development, right when the nerves and the brain are starting to form and emerge, which incidentally is also when the gene that give us the white markings also become active. Maybe there's a connection there, and maybe they have an impact on the overall physiology and behavior of the animal as it develops. 
We might not know why, but one thing for sure is that the DNA test on archaeological remain of horses confirmed that the frequency of genes causing white markings start to increase right at the time of domestication. We just don't quite know which explanation it is yet. But we can see it in other species, too. Looking at early representation in cave paintings and DNA analysis of wild types, and comparing them to today's domesticated relative, we see that it's happened over and over again in cattle, with dogs, with pigs, with llamas, with rabbits, and yes, more recently, with foxes. The presence of white marking is now considered the fingerprint of domestication. And it's a fingerprint we find in today's wild mustangs, for example, indicating that they are, in fact, descended from domestic stock, with very well-established color variation and markings that were in their genetic prior to them returning to the wild. So, is there any predictability to markings, or are they more the result of luck and randomness, then? Well, when we observe that various breed of horses have either encouraged or discouraged the presence of markings, we get a clue that, yeah, markings can either be established, maintained, or conversely eliminated from certain population through selective breeding. And that's a pretty strong hint that there's a genetic connection. Originally, probably in order to have matching pairs or sets of horses to pull carriage and look very good as a mark of prestige and wealth, it was probably encouraged to have either all horses with similar marking, or to make it even easier to have no markings at all. The Frisian, for example, they're known for being all black through selective breeding and elimination from the gene pool of any individual that would carry chestnut or white markings. And as a result, right now, they're all black. It's not the only breed to have done so. Fell ponies, Cleveland bays, the Polish konix, Belgian drafts, and more recently, the American percheron has been dominated by all black or all gray animals with no markings. The one that surprised me the most was the pre, the pure raza espanol, right? What we also call the Andalusian. Those with too much white are actually not accepted in the breeding books. So, if you happen to see an Iberian horse with a lot of white, then it's probably a Lusitano, because the Lusitano impose no restriction on either color or markings, but the pre do. Taking the complete opposite approach, we have breeds that have consolidated white marking as part of their breed characteristic. The previously mentioned Clydesdale, but also the Shire, the Hackney, the Dutch Harness Horse, and of course, the Paint Horse. However, other breeds that have been bred mostly for performance generally have less or less predictable markings. The Racing Thoroughbred, the Standard Bred, the French Trotter, and the various warm blood breeds that are specifically for jumping or eventing generally have fewer markings, or at least nobody is really paying attention to those markings. When looking at a population of horse and trying to understand the way the markings were passed on from parents to foal, scientists started to seem to think that maybe there was a pattern of inheritance that would be best explained by being controlled by genes with two versions of each other, one where one is dominant over the other. MITG and the KIT genes can all produce marking by disrupting the distribution of melanocyte to the extremities and to the head. But horses that have more than one of these genes have more markings. Another factor at play, and also one you've perhaps noticed yourself, is that the base color of the horse seems to have an impact on the strength of the expression of the markings. Right? Chestnut horses generally show more white than bays, and bays showing more white than blacks. So, the base color of the horse seemed to have an impact also. In my personal experience, breeding horses for over 20 years, I found that it's the agouti gene. The agouti gene is what turns a black horse into a bay horse. If a horse is homozygous for the agouti, I find that it suppresses the expression of the white. So, my recipe, your best bet, if you want to breed a horse with lots of white, is to make sure that one parent has white markings. The more, the better. And pair them with one that does not have the agouti gene to maximize the chance of the foal having white markings. If you like that kind of things. Not everybody does, and I get that. There is obviously a certain amount of inheritance at play. But when it gets really fascinating is when you look at what happens when you clone a horse. You'd expect identical markings, right? Not quite. 
even clones, genetically identical, have subtle difference, like twins with matching outfits, but different shoes. If we look at those six clones of the same horse, they all have very similar marking. Same thing here if we look at those three clones of Frenchman Guy. That actually, Frenchman Guy looks like this. So you can see that they ended up with almost the same marking, not quite. And then these four warm blood clones clearly show their similarities to whichever one was the first one. It is believed that this randomness comes from tiny variation in the womb environment, but the overall pattern? Still strikingly similar. So as you can see, the story of white marking on horses is a fascinating mix of genetic, selective breeding, and a bit of unpredictability, even with clones. So whether you're admiring a flash of white on a harness horse going by, or tracing the history of marking across the breed that you prefer, it all comes back to the science behind what makes each horse a bit of a very special and unique painting. If you're curious to dig even deeper into equine genetic and to discover why certain traits or colors are so rare, or how to find them, check out this video or that one. And if you like the scientific, practical aspect of raising horses, then you're in the right place, because that's pretty much all I talk about. I want to thank my Patreon members that support the channel, and also you for watching all the way to the end. I learned plenty researching all of this, and if you would like to see the article that I used to learn all this, then head to my Patreon page. The link is in the description, or you can scan the QR code showing up here.